Hello, how's it going? Somebody asked me in the Discord server, link down below, how fast do loops operate in Python? Now that's a bit of a weird question because it's so open-ended. It really depends on what you want to do in the loop. Depending on what you want to do, there's a bunch of different options and optimizations that you can do. Um, so I decided that I would, well, this is such a simple question. I thought I'd just do a quick demonstration of it a few different ways. Now, the goal that I've chosen is say we have two arrays, both of which have a million random numbers in it. And I want to look through the arrays one element at a time, add them together, put their sum in a third array. Okay. Let me just get into this. Okay, here we go. So as you can see, I'm just generating a bunch of random numbers. We got that. And this is the fully naive, fully whatever way of doing it. So we look through, put those in one by one, time how long that whole thing took. Now you may be surprised to see that that only takes 0.1 seconds. Most of the time is actually in originally getting the random numbers to generate those arrays. So 0.1 seconds is pretty good for a million numbers. So it seems to be that just looping by itself, doing very little is reasonable. Then the question is, are there any, any optimizations we can do? Well, clearly, you know, it might be a little strange to be constantly appending to grow this from zero size up to what we need when we actually know ahead of time how big the result should be. So let's make another version where we allocate all the space that we'll need first and then work with it. So currently C should be the, <laughs> C should be the correct size and we can just index into it the same way as we would with the other arrays. Okay, let's have a look at that. Okay, so there is some performance improvement. Interestingly, it's not an order of magnitude. It's maybe like 1%, 1% improvement, 2% improvement or something. So it turns out that that optimization is not massive. And that's sort of explained by looking up the way NumPy's append function works under the hood. But, um, okay, let's have a look at another method and that is list comprehension. So a list comprehension is sort of like an inline loop, if that makes sense. We're constructing a list and we have a rule for what all the elements should be. So what we can do is just take this and say, okay, that's our sort of our, our generator statement for the elements and then the actual expression that we're going to evaluate for each element. So there we go. This is a list comprehension. Um, it's evaluated like that. And how long does that take? So see, we, we starting, we are starting to get a significant speed up. This is now close to, well, not that close to, but I want to say almost a half, like almost double speed up. So that's all well and good. That is all well and good. But how do we speed it up more? So I just want you to note that in this first case, in this naive case, this is like the most Python friendly way of doing it. It's completely flexible. You can do whatever you want. You have a lot of control here. And as we go down, I guess we have a lot of control here too. But as we go down, we're going to start to get more optimal, but we're also going to start to get more constrained. And this last example, I might do one more example, but this is like 
one of the more constrained cases, and that is to do everything in NumPy. Oh, actually, and before I get to that, before I get to that, just to make sure this isn't throwing off my performance, I should probably change these variables. So it's fine to have A and B as before, but each time I make one of these new ones, I wanna make sure that I'm using a new variable just so that the previous result hasn't been cached at all. I think it's fine to leave A and B as they are because yeah, A and B might be cached or something, but here we're already exploiting cache coherency. So anyway, but what you'll see if I run this right now is that we still have roughly the same performance. So I'm, I'm not too concerned. Okay, so NumPy. Let's give this a go. Whoa, whoa. Is that crazy? Look, all right, so we've gone from close to 0.1 seconds, down a little bit, down a little bit more, whoa. Like 20 times faster. What is that? 25 times faster, approximately? It's fast. It's fast is my point. Um, let's, let's run this again. Yeah, I mean, look at that. Look at that. We've gone from 0.1 seconds to 0.001 seconds. That's a hundred times speed up. So, I mean, it should be, if you have any NumPy experience, it should be obvious why this is a lot faster. One thing is a NumPy array is dealing with the raw zeros and ones for the numbers. It's not making a weird Python object to represent a float or an integer or something. It's just dealing with the raw data. So there's that. There are less memory indirects to find the, the actual numbers. So less pointer dereferences under the hood. So you have direct memory access to the raw zeros and ones. It's fast. Then in addition to that, when we take A numeric plus B numeric, Python, sorry, NumPy jumps into its underlying library operates, sorry, <laughs> executes one of these operators. And first of all, that library is compiled, so it's a lot faster. But secondly, it's also vectorized. So to the extent that it can, NumPy will try to batch things together and add, add, ugh, batch things together and add consecutive numbers. Now, like I said, this, this is constraining things because now instead of doing a fully flexible Python programming style, we need to deal with arrays of numbers. That's not the craziest thing. I mean, what, you're programming in ones and zeros and for some reason you can't express your program in maths? Hello, it's all maths. It was maths in the beginning. Okay, so there's that. If you can find a way to orient your design around your data, then you can take advantage of this. Now, I wasn't sure if I should include this because it doesn't quite work out as well, but I'll, I'll include it anyway. Um, and that is, we can just in time compile our code as well. Um, so let me just quickly mock this up. I'm in the habit of writing signatures. I know it does nothing for number, but I just like it. I like being explicit. explicit. So what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, yeah, this expression here. Let me just, let me just do this. Okay, so this is pretty much the naive loop. And the only difference is that, let me do this, let me say, uh, Okay, so, so we can see it's, it's the same stuff. If I run this right now, it'll go really slow. As a matter of fact, let me, let me do that. Let me just call this uh, number code. Okay, so you can see it's sort of, it's doing okay. It's a little faster, I guess. So let's do this. Let's add a decorator, and this is invoking the number ngit um, module, which stands for like number just in time compile. 
I'll talk about that in a second. So if I run this, oh, it's not great. What's happening? Actually, changed my mind. Let me just, I'm curious. I, I actually didn't test this. There we go. Okay. That's fine. So now let's try it with just in time compilation and it doesn't work great. 0.2 seconds. Let me try that again. 0.12 seconds. Come on, work with me. Number, you're making a bad impression. Let me just try delete this. Yeah, so in this case, it's not, it's not working well, which is why I wasn't originally going to include this. But let me just talk through what's happening. So what this is doing is this function, this bit of code is actually being compiled, which normally makes it a lot faster. But I believe that possibly because it's not doing enough work in this function, the, the fastness of it just really isn't. We're not getting it, unfortunately. It's actually sort of a mystery. I thought it was, anyway, I'll stop talking. Okay, so um, what this cache equals true does is normally, yeah, maybe it takes a few runs to really warm this thing up, but um, when I deleted that cache, you saw that it took 0.19 seconds to run it, and then it created this pi cache, and then the second time I ran this, the speed was down to 0.12 seconds. So what this cache equals true is doing is it's writing the compiled function over here, writing the compiled function to some sort of file somewhere. And then the next time it's called, it actually uses that. So let me try a trick. And then I really will be done. Okay. Okay. I see what you did there. Try that again. Sorry, this must be a horrible video to watch. I'm, I'm being really obnoxious. Have a look at this. Okay. Look for real. 0.1 seconds, 0 0.09 seconds, 0 0.6, 0 0.02, 0 0.0 seconds. Oh my goodness. It's too fast. It's too fast. Okay, I'm joking. I'm joking. So yeah, that, that was actually my suspicion. So I think maybe, maybe I needed to do a dry run of the function that didn't really do anything just to get it like refreshed and warmed up and everything. And then on successive, <clears throat> on successive runs, it goes blazing fast. It goes like faster than, um, we probably aren't even going fast enough to measure this, like doing enough elements to measure this properly. Um, super fast, super fast, but writing NGIT compiled code has its own restrictions. And really what it comes down to is we need to be able to express everything in numeric arrays and basically we can't do object oriented stuff if we're compiling this code it, it doesn't like classes but anyway that has been enough i reckon for today i hope you had fun i hope you got something out of this and happy development all right have a good one bye